Thank you very much, folks. Uh, as Chris said, my name is Barry Sinegrown, and I am here to talk to you about the most famous person you've undoubtedly never heard of. Uh, certainly the most famous daredevil you've never heard of. Um, to get an idea of his popularity, in 1914 alone, he performed his death-defying feats in front of 17 million people. That is nearly a quarter of the population of the United States at that time. Railroad companies changed their schedules and routes to get admirers to him. The United States Congress adjourned twice from formal sessions in 1906 and 1914 to witness his performances. His name, Lincoln Beachy. He is arguably the inventor of aerobatics. He was also a member of the San Francisco Motorcycle Club, of which I am the current president. <clears throat> He was born in San Francisco in 1887. By the age of 13, he ran his own bicycle shop. And at 15, he was repairing motorcycles and small engines. He also worked for the Varney Sign and Billboard Company and would claim that someday you'll see my name on the boards. Everyone who knew Beachy said that he was fearless. At nine years old, he was known to fly down Fillmore Street on a rusty old bicycle. Later, with the help of fellow SFMC founder George Payton, he attached a one-cylinder engine to a bicycle and rode it down Golden Gate Avenue at 40 miles an hour. In 1905, at the age of 17, Beachy started his career as a dirigible pilot in Thomas Scott Baldwin's balloon troupe. Beachy helped build the dirigible California Arrow, powered by a Curtis motorcycle engine. He then built his own dirigible and, as a publicity stunt, flew it around the Washington Monument and landed it on the lawn of the White House, walked inside and asked to see President Roosevelt, who wasn't home at the time, but he and Mrs. Roosevelt had a nice visit. In 1910, Beachy piloted his balloon in a massive air show near Los Angeles, racing against a fixed-wing aircraft. He was beaten badly. This led Beachy to comment to our colleague, our racket is dead. He quit flying his airship, which other aviators had, had branded the rubber cow, and took up piloting planes. In the fall of 1910, Beachy began flying lessons at the Curtis Flying School. His first two attempts at fixed wing flight ended in piles of rubble. Though Beachy was unscathed, Curtis thought he should go back to flying his rubber cow and threatened, rubble, uh, and threatened Lincoln with dismissal. But the team manager calmed the situation and on his third try, Beachy flew. Beachy joined the Curtis exhibition team touring the nation and almost immediately became the star. And by the end of 1911, Beachy had become their greatest moneymaker. In just one year, he earned what today would be the equivalent of $3 million, and during his career, easily 10 times that. It was his flirtation with death at Niagara Falls that made Beachy a household name only six months after he had learned to fly. Beachy plunged into the Roaring Gorge and flew under the giant arch of Honeymoon Bridge with his engine wide open, then right down the narrowing gorge almost to the rapids. He was no more than 20 feet above the jagged rocks and churning torrent before he pulled back on the controls and soared skyward again, his wings dripping wet from the spray. As his trademark, when other pilots wore leather coats, helmets, and boots, Beachy wore a business suit, starched collar, diamond stick pin, and checkered golf cap. <laughs> While some argue that he purposefully dressed formally to convey the normalcy of flight, it also gave him a dapper look, which surely appealed to his audience, especially the women. America's superstar aeronaut attracted legions of groupies. He bought diamond engagement rings by the dozen. He had a fiance at every stop, and when May, his first wife, divorced him, the judge silenced her after she'd recited 32 cities where women claimed her husband's undying adoration. <clears throat> the tailspin was one of the greatest causes of disaster from which no pilot knew how to recover, but Beachy believed that there was a way. One morning, he climbed his plane to 5,000 feet and, mustering all of his courage, nosed over, forcing his plane into the deadly spin. Down and down, the aircraft twirled, whipping its pilots around, pilot around inside the pivoting nose. Beachy kicked the rudder hard in the direction of the spin, and slowly, the plane responded, leveling out. Astonished, he climbed skyward again and then attempted the feat 11 more times, each time successfully recovering. 
At the 1911 Chicago International Aviation Meet, he won multiple awards for stunts and set a new altitude record. He filled his tanks with fuel and then said he would point the plane's nose skyward and keep going until the fuel ran out. For an hour and 48 minutes, he spiraled upward until the engine sputtered and died. The plane glided in spirals to the ground and Beachy climbed out numb and stiff. The barograph aboard the plane showed he had reached a height of 11,578 feet, temporarily setting the world's altitude record. In the second international aviation meet held in Chicago in 1912, Beachy showed a humorous side. After presenting a series of thrilling stunts, unbeknownst to the spectators, he donned a silk dress, a wig, an opera cape, and unlimited quantities of chiffon, fleece, and ribbon, becoming Madame Lavasseur, a French aviatrix who knew almost nothing about flying. Making a wobbly takeoff, he darted first in one direction and then in the other. With apparent lack of ability to keep the plane level, he dipped dangerously close to the lake, pulling up a scant few feet from the water and sending automobiles and carriages on Michigan Avenue scurrying in all directions for safety as he fluttered helplessly above the boulevard. After bringing utter havoc among the spectators, he landed and revealed his true identity. When the governor of California offended him for unknown reasons, Beachy did an aerial striptease. Each time he passed the bleachers, he tossed down an article of clothing. Here a checkered cap, there a starched collar fluttering down. He landed wearing only shorts and socks and taxied to his hangar. He hopped down and flexed his muscles at the crowd, telling his mechanic, now I'd like to hear what that damn stuffed shirt has to say about Lincoln Beachy. In 1915, Beachy took off inside the machinery palace on the exposition grounds here at the San Francisco World's Fair. He flew the plane at 60 miles an hour and landed it, becoming the first person to fly a plane inside a building. In 1913, Frenchman Adolphe Pogot made the first inside loop, and Beachy wanted to try it himself. Curtis refused to build him a plane capable of the stunt, and Beachy left the flying team. At the same time, he wrote a scathing essay about how stunt flying, stating most people came to exhibitions out of a morbid eagerness to see young pilots die. On March 7, 1913, he announced he would never fly again professionally, believing he was indirectly responsible for the tragic deaths of several young aviators who had tried to emulate his stunts. Beachy went into the real estate business for a time until Curtis reluctantly agreed to build a stunt plane powerful enough to do the inside loop. Beachy returned and on October 7th took the plane up. Unfortunately, on its first, on its first flight, either a downdraft or a loss of speed allowing, following a turn caused the plane to dip momentarily. One wing clipped the ridge pole of a tent on the field and the plane then swept four people off the roof of a nearby hangar from where they had been watching the flight, contrary to Beachy's wishes. One woman was killed and others injured as a result of the fall, a distance of about 10 feet. Beachy decided for the second time to leave aviation. However, the sight of a circus poster changed his mind. The poster depicted a plane flying upside down, a stunt that hadn't actually been attempted yet. Beachy was determined to master the loop and upside down flight, but decided to go it alone. After he first successfully completed the loop, he wrote a poignant reflection saying, the silent reaper of souls and I shook hands that day. Thousands of times we've engaged in a race among the clouds, plunging headlong into breathless flight, diving and circling with awful speed through the ethereal space. And many times when the dazzling sunlight has blinded my eyes and sudden darkness has numbed all of my senses, I have imagined him close at my heels. On such occasions, I have defied him, but in doing so, have experienced fright, which I cannot explain. Today, the old fellow and I are pals. He tried making a living demonstrating loops on exhibition grounds, but soon found that people would not pay to see a stunt that they could easily see outside the gates. He retired for a third time but returned when his manager had an idea that he depicted in a poster. The demon of the sky against the daredevil of the ground. Beachy was to race his plane against a racing car driven by the popular Barney Oldfield. Oldfield is legendary for being the first race car driver to go 60 miles an hour and the first person to complete a 100 mile an hour lap on the Indianapolis Speedway. The manager made sure there was a high fence around the exhibition grounds, forcing people to pay if they wanted to see the race. Beachy's plane was faster than Oldfield's car, but they took turns winning, and crowds flocked to see their daily competitions. The pair turned out to be one of the greatest outdoor attractions ever known, staging shows in cities across the country th throughout 1914. In an incredible display of plane agility and pilot accuracy, Beachy would swoop down and actually knock off Oldfield's hat 
With the money he earned by racing, Beachy designed and built a new plane, the Little Looper. He had his name painted in three-foot-high letters across the top wing. Soon, he was flying multiple loops. Whenever he heard about another pilot setting a record for flying continuous loops, Beachy would promptly break it, flying as many as 80 loops in a row. Beachy and Oldfield toured the country, staging races everywhere they went. In Dayton, Ohio, home of the Wright brothers, they performed a crowd to a crowd of 30,000. In 1914, he dive-bombed the White House and Congress in a mock attack, pro proving that the U.S. government was woefully unprepared for the age of aerial warfare that was upon it. On March 14, 1915, Beachy had built his dream ship, a silver monoplane with bright yellow wings and an 80-horsepower rotary engine that flew twice as fast as his biplane. He would test it before 50,000 paying spectators at the Panama Pacific International Exhibition in San Francisco. Another 200,000 watched from the hillsides. The aluminum fuselage gave him such unmatched quickness that a friend, Ted McCauley, warned Beachy against looping. It'll be okay, Beachy replied, as long as I don't pull out too tightly. His mechanic, Arthur Mixed, removed the chocks and Beachy took off with an instrument he felt finally worthy of his abilities. For 10 minutes, he flew low-level loops over the bay, an ocean roll, a mock tail spin. Then he came in for a landing. She's a homesick angel, he told Mix. Gas her up, I'm going back again. Take it easy, Mix replied. This baby's a lot faster than anything you've flown. Don't worry, Beachy winked through his oil-stained goggles. Keep your eye open, I'll ring her out this time. Beachy arrowed upward for a dip of death. At 3,000 feet, he hurtled out of the sky faster than any pilot had ever flown, too fast. At 500 feet, two cracks echoed across the bay. The left wing folded upward, then the right. The plane became a trembling yellow V as he nosedived toward the water. Beachy shut off the engine and fuel line. His last gesture, which thousands witnessed from the grandstand, was a small goodbye wave with the fingers of his right hand. Navy men jumped into action, but it took one hour and 45 minutes to recover Beachy's body. Even then, rescuers spent three hours trying to revive him. The autopsy found that he had survived the crash and had died from drowning. His funeral in San Francisco was said to be the largest in the city's history up until then. It is said that calls for news knocked out the city's telephone system for two days. He is buried at the Cypress Lawn Cemetery, just south of here in Colma, and his favorite biplane, the Little Looper, is on display at the Hiller Aviation Museum in San Carlos. To Lincoln Beachy. I've got a copy of the book, his biography, and I can show you if you have questions afterward. Thank you very much.